Guys, if I could figure out these technical difficulties, I'm going to have another episode for you this week. Let's try this. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host, and I'm coming at you from the Broken Tine studio right here in Clark Fork, Idaho, and I have got a uh, really cool guest for you guys this week. Uh, it's somebody I've been following for a long time. I've been listening to his podcast for a long time, uh, and he's uh, he's an inspiring guy with a lot to say, with a really good message, and I want to welcome Johnny Mack to the show. Brother, how you doing? I'm doing well, Jim. How are you doing, brother? Thanks for having me on. Hey, not too bad. I finally figured it out. It sounds like everything is recording right now. So, oh, dude, that's a win. It always <laughs> helps when you record your podcast episodes. Right? So, uh, for those of you listening, it's it's been, uh, we had like Snowmageddon come in already. It's uh, it's just as bad as last winter already, and it's it's not even officially winter. Anyway, it knocked out my power and my internet, and it screwed up my settings to record. So, me and Johnny have been like trying to get this thing going for like 15 minutes straight. Sorry about that, man. Hey, it's the life of a podcaster. Anyone who uh, has dabbled in technology knows that sometimes you're always at the mercy of electronics and, and the system. So, it's all yeah, good. man. Yeah, man. And that's that's the thing is I only dabble in technology. So when something goes wrong, it's like a disaster. So bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just part of the game, I guess. So uh, let's kick us off, Johnny. I, I want to know a little bit. I've got some I've got some unique questions for you because of your recent move um, that I had in mind. But uh, let's kick it off. Tell for anybody that doesn't know who you are. Uh, give us a brief uh, who Johnny Mac is. Oh man, I appreciate that. So, uh, Johnny Mack, I am a, uh, I'm a father of three young boys, a husband to a beautiful wife, and a freedom loving individual that loves his country and loves hunting, and loves hunting so much that I want to share it with every single person I, I interact with, which is why I ended up creating my my mission and my platform, and that is a mentorship is conservation and. And uh, part of the Soul Seekers podcast and Soul Seekers show on Carbon TV and my website and blog and all the content that I put out because I believe that hunting has the power to transform lives through primal adventure. And everybody needs to at least have the experience of that so that they can draw from perspectives, not just opinions. And where, where does that come from? Like the, the idea that, that hunting is mentorship and, and living you know through primal adventure uh, where where does that mindset come from? Because you haven't always been a hunter, have you? No, no. I took my hunter safety class at the age of 30. And for me, hunting uh, was the very first thing. Now, now, this is not probably common with everyone. Um, I, I come from a household that it, it was riddled with confusion. And I was raised to be like the mini-me to my father. And I drove the same car as him and worked at the same uh, school as him and I was supposed to take over his head football program and you know I was, I was his legacy well mm -hmm. doing this doing this legacy for other people and, and living a life for other people it wasn't it wasn't what I wanted and what I wanted was adventure in the mountains and to hunt and understand self-reliance and grit and determination and courage and this idea of you know the cowboy up on his horse out west just taking care of himself and and his his you know cattle or whatever it is like this idea of going west and challenging your soul was always there always pricking at myself and so it, it, it took me until the age of 30 where i was like okay uh, screw it i'm i'm taking my hunter safety course i was coaching high school football at the time i realized that uh if i was going to be a hunter 
I was going to have to hunt around my coaching seasons and being a school teacher, you know, being a football coach and school teachers like, well, your falls are dedicated to the classroom and to the football field. And so this, this idea of hunting really was like, Oh, how do I squeeze this in? Yeah. That's so tough, first, man. I, yeah. So at first I was like, well, I'm going to be a coyote hunter. I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to call coyotes and, and make that happen. And I would win a field a couple of times and never saw any animals. And then I really understood that big game hunting in the state of Washington, black bear season opens August 1st and in the state of Washington, Football starts about August 16th, and I was always in the mountains backpacking for the first two weeks of August, whether it was Pacific Crest Trail, the Wonderland Trail, or on Mount Rainier, just all sorts of different adventures. The problem was is that hiking is really awesome, but it wasn't satiating my soul. The idea of going out and finding something and taking it back home with me really, really excited me and challenged me because the whole idea of black bear hunting, dude, I, I was raised scared to death of bears in the woods. I thought <laughs> there's bear waiting around every log, every stump, every corner. Yeah. And so for me to be like, okay, well, I'm going to use the first two weeks of August before football starts to hunt black bears. Cause that's the only season that I can really dedicate time to, I guess I'm a black bear hunter. I never, I never tried black bear meat. I never, I like, yeah, I went in completely blind, except that I knew how to backpack. And so I was like, well, here we go. Let's let's figure it out. Did you go with somebody at first or did you just go on your own? Yeah, so that's so I recruited uh, I recruited two buddies at the time. And one of them is still part of uh, Soul Seekers. And that's the two shot Tony. He's our video editor and my hunting partner. Uh-huh. I So I reached out to Tony we met through a flag football league and I ended up tearing my shoulder in that and just being like, I oh, dude, sports is fun, but I can't keep doing this to my body. And so I became good friends with Tony. I was like, Tony, you want to, you want to start hunting with me? And he's like, Oh yeah, sounds like a great idea. And so I sent him a link to Hunter safety course and he took it uh, on his phone. He was a brewmaster at his family's brewery. And so in between brewing batches of beer, he was taking this Hunter safety course and, he, uh, him and one other guy, I refused to go up into the mountains. And I was like, I, I got this spot. It looks really promising. And uh, we're going to hike this trail all the way in. It's August. It's a heat wave. And we're going to go hunt for bears. And so we uh, set off in the mountains. And we, we hike in. It's a long hike. And we finally get to camp. And the other two guys, Tony and this other fella, are just beat down from the, the hike and, like, and not to throw them under the that's not the point of it but it's like the hike I've ever done to uh, going in for a hunt and since then I've gone on quite a, quite a few adventures and it was, it was taxing yeah. taxing uh, to say the least so we get up there we're in the back country um, like nine miles deep away from any road and I'm like, all right, baby, let's do this. And so we set up and we just start glassing and not really sure how to find bears. I've never really experienced too many bears in the wild before. Um, and, and all of a sudden, you know, you kind of start seeing them pop up on this hillside. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, we're running low on light, kind of far away. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to them. And so the day end is, ends up closing. We go to bed. Next morning, we wake up, we go start glassing, and about about an hour after we start glassing, I start hearing a dog barking. It's just, woof, 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 woof. I'm like, oh, are no. you kidding me? We're nine miles into the backcountry, and there's a dog barking? And sure enough, there was a female yoga instructor from Seattle and her two male students, and their dog came rolling up into camp from our glassing location, and I was like, dude, I thought the whole idea, now this is like the, the newbie mentality. I was like, the whole idea was to get away from people yeah, and to, to get away. So you're not scaring animals off and all this. I had no concept of, of hunting, but so I was like, okay, um, I guess uh, this is a great opportunity to, um, you know, be an ambassador for hunting. And this is where the concept of how everything that we always do as a hunter always is at the forefront of what we are. People are always watching. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, here I am. I'm a brand new hunter. 
But I know that in the state of Washington and Western Washington, that, you know, it, well, really based off the politics, you can see what's happening in the state of Washington with the spring bear hunts and, and the Fish and Wildlife Commission. It's it's not very friendly towards hunters. Yeah. And yeah. so here here we are, three dudes dressed in camo up in the mountains with, with rifles. And this lady walks up and these two guys and their dog and they kind of look at us funny and I'm looking at them funny. I'm like, you're a long ways in here to not have any backpacks or like any, any real supplies. And it was a long day hike for you. And they're like, yeah, we just thought we'd get out and check it out. They're like, why, why are you guys wearing camo? I was like, we're hunting. They're like, you're hunting. I was like, yeah. They're like, what are you hunting? We're like black bears. And, and, and this, high. Johnny, this was like a, this was a, yoga instructor chick that that took her students up hiking or something oh yeah it was uh <laughs> really an, an experience you don't see see that i don't know if they were up there to just kind of enjoy nature and and uh commune with nature or if they doing like on doing like some yoga moves up on the mountain <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> so so what was her so, reaction when you're like well we're hunting black bears yeah i was like we're hunting black bears she's like you're hunting black bears I, I didn't know you could hunt black bears. I was like, yeah, you can. And then all of a sudden it hit her. She's like, wait a minute, there's bears around here. And I was like, well, I hope there's bears around here, you know? (laughs) And so uh, I was like, yeah, you know, we're, you know, trying to get away from the crowd and get to uh, where we can be. And so this interaction of like, Hey, we're friendly hunters. We're not bad people. Um, And this is probably your first time ever, experiencing this in the wild and it it was like a culture shock to me and i'm sure for her now i come from i used to work at rei i used to sell backpacks and work in a camping department so i understand and i I use the term granola side of life the Um, granola hippies yeah yeah the a little bit more because that's what i used to engage in before i was a hunter and so um you know understand i'm talking with them and all that well, I was also wearing Birkenstocks. I, I, my camp shoes, I'm a huge Birkenstock fan. Maybe it's the granola in me, the, the REI rubbing off. Um, but that's my camp shoe. Do you and know so, Do you know Guy Duplanchet? I sure do. <laughs> that's for you, Guy. Do you guy, he, <laughs> did he send you the Birkenstocks? No, I didn't even. He's a big Birkenstock guy. I think no. That's the rumor. No, I'm kidding. He 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 was. Uh, we had a we had a whole conversation on a podcast we did about Birkenstocks, and this I I didn't know what Birkenstocks were when he brought it up, and then that jerk went down to some store where they were selling Birkenstocks, and took a picture and tagged me in it like I was the Birkenstock wearer, and so and we and we had this this whole running joke about Birkenstocks, and it took I I didn't even know what they were. And so he introduced me to the whole concept of Birkenstocks. And now I'm talking to you who's up bear hunting wearing Birkenstocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so I kind of jumped a little bit ahead right there. It's so like we're glassing throughout the day and they're loitering around our campsite destination. Um, it gets to be about evening time and, and we're uh, making meals and getting ready to go out for the evening hunt. And at that point, that's when I was wearing the Birkenstocks. I was like, I'm kicking off my boots for a little bit. Their their dog was drinking some water in the in the creek, and all of a sudden, she yells, "Bear!" And I'm like, <laughs> "What? You got to be kidding me!" And my other two buddies they they perk up real quick and it's like, "What?" And they run over to her and and then they they take off well they both grabbed rifles and i was like there is no way this lady is telling the truth she is pulling our chain i do not believe uh what's going on so i i slip on my birkenstocks i got some shorts on uh you know it's like 95 degrees out in the beginning of august and i grab my binoculars and i kind of meander over to her and i'm like did you really see a bear? And I look at her, she's just ghost white. Oh, really? And, and I'm like, wait a minute. And she points and she goes right over there. And I look and about 150 yards away, um, I didn't see a bear, but she was like, it was right there. I was like, okay, well, if it was right there, where did it go? She's like, it ran that way. 
And so I just take off running to catch up to my buddies because I saw it in her face. Like she was being for real. She just got scared that there was a bear there. And it was how, so how close far to away? Her. About a hundred and hundred and fifty yards from oh, our gotcha. camp. Oh, gotcha. Okay, okay. Where her, where her dogs are hanging out. All of us are hanging out. Um, I mean, we're in a prime area for berries uh, in the month of August. But yeah. so I catch up to my buddies, and they're standing there on the trail, and they're looking and they're looking, and all of a sudden, out of the bushes, I see this black bear pop out. I'm like, oh, it's right there! It's right there! Shoot it! Shoot it! <laughs> and uh, my buddies are like, where, where, where? And I don't have a gun, so I'm like, shoot it! And oh, no. uh, two, sh- two shot Tony goes, here, take my gun. And so he hands me my gun or his gun. And I go, is it, is it loaded? He's like, yeah. And I, I check the chamber real quick. I slam it. I slam that, uh, that action close. And I just take off sprinting. I think I set a world record for the, the fastest person to ever cover ground at Birkenstocks. Yeah, man. And I just chased this bear about 300 yards. And I stopped. And I look to my left, and about 30 yards, this bear pops out and stares right into me. And him and I, well, her and I, it was, it was a sow, uh, we lock eyes. And that was a moment I will never forget in my entire life. The, the moment when I connected with nature, not only as a, an observer, but as a participant. And I locked eyes, the world slowed down. I pulled up that gun, and I shot that bear at 30 yards and it died and death moaned right in front of me. Wow. And, and this is all just a couple hundred yards away from this yoga instructor and her students and their dog. And they heard the gunshot and you hear him yell, is it safe? Is it safe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just in shock. Like what the heck just happened? What the heck just happened? And so, um, talk about being an ambassador for hunting is not only did we get to promote hunting and bear hunting and predator hunting, um, but we also got to uh, do that in front of them and have them experience it. And then for them to get to see an animal that was dead and yeah. like, like, holy smoke. So yeah, that was my uh, intro- introduction to hunting. <laughs> so you, you went, you went hunting in Birkenstocks. And no, I went. On, I went in boots, but I, I like to bring camp shoes with me. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Okay, and and then and then you the the granola yoga hippie or whatever you called her, <laughs> or maybe yep. I called her that. Um, she pointed out the bear. You get this bear, and and like when did she and and her students come over and like check out the bear after? Oh yeah, she was at least brave. That her her two students were pretty timid. They, you know, it's kind of like, and they were dudes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was really interesting. So this was all in Washington, right? Yep. State of Washington. Uh, Did you, were you like born and raised in Washington or? Born and raised in Washington. Uh, Lived there for 37 years of my life until this year. I I decided to uh, hit the road, hit the open road and see what else is out there. And I moved my family to the state of Texas. The great state of Texas. So I, I'm I'm curious about that. I want to talk about that. Like, first of all, do you have any houses next door? Like, do you want to be neighbors? Because I've I've had it with this Idaho snow. Um, it's only the fourth, and I'm <laughs> out of places to push snow on my property, and I'm worried we're going to get stuck up here. <laughs> oh <laughs> man, I tell you, well, you know, land is not cheap, uh, but I did move to a wonderful little neighborhood, and that is. Uh, one acre parcels and no HOA because that is a part of why I want to want to get to Texas and the freedom that it provides. Um, and yeah, I have neighbors, but they're, they're pleasant people and everyone is so kind down here and, and people are willing to engage with you in conversation and take time out of their day to, to speak with you, which I don't know, is it called the Seattle freeze or the, the Northwest freeze, but the concept of like people you could, you could be standing in an elevator and I used to do this for fun back when I was, I don't know, I had a, I had a little, you know, maybe in my twenties, my, my weird immature days, you know, I'd walk into an elevator and like stand facing people rather than turn my back to them <laughs> <laughs> because I want to see if they, I want to see if they talk to me. <laughs> what was that? What was that old? I think it was like an SNL skit or something. The, the dude gets in the elevator, there's people in there and he just starts kind of giggling and he goes, man, I like cheese. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Randomly, people he doesn't even know. <laughs> right, just just to see how people respond. And, yeah, and, yeah. And the Pacific Northwest people keep to themselves so much. Yeah, they do, man. So much. You know, uh, there's a lack of eye contact. There's a lack of you know knowing your neighbors. The concept of being neighborly is foreign. It seems like these days, or at least uh, where I was at. And you know, you live your life so much at home. And yet you don't even know the people that you're sharing a fence line with. It's yeah. really fascinating. I know. Now it's crazy, man. It's it's super crazy. And and I don't think I don't think that's just a Northwest thing. I think that that you know, if you look just across the country, the difference in in like you know when I, when I grew up, we all knew our neighbors. We all knew the neighbor kids and would would hang out together and go you know uh, play in the in, in the fields um, where they were raising alfalfa or whatever where I was growing up and you know we we all knew each other and like today these these neighborhoods nobody knows each other anymore nobody welcomes you to the neighborhood nobody you know the kids aren't out playing anymore and I, I think that's a big I, I don't know if it's good or bad um, my my uh, my gut feeling says it's a bad thing but uh, sounds like you're you're in a better spot. And what what part of Texas are you in? I'm about a half hour west of Fort Worth in a little town called Weatherford. Um, it's uh, Weatherford is like the cowboy capital of Texas, ironically. Huh. Um, big, big horse place, really big ranches. Um, they film a lot of Yellowstone in 1883 here. Uh, Taylor Sheridan, the creator of Yellowstone, uh-huh. actually lives lives here in Weatherford and. About a quarter mile oh, down really? the street, little little cafe they filmed in. And it was a really fascinating place. Hey, if you ever you know, run into him, will you tell him that I'd like to get him on the show here? I know, right? Right. That's a great idea. We'll do a two for one. Let's I'll, do it. I'll man. get him right after you. Yeah. No. We'll just <laughs> let's let's all three of us jump on, and and between the two of us, we'll tag team him with questions, and it'll be a great episode. Man, that'd be so so <laughs> awesome. So, so awesome. So backing up just a little bit, Johnny. Like what? You're you're going along. You're you're a bear hunter. You're uh, you're a high school teacher in Washington, and all of a sudden now you you're not an educator anymore, right? Uh, nope. This last year, uh, this last June uh, of 2022 was my last year of teaching. And what what happened, man? What made you want to all of a sudden move to Texas? Was it just the I don't know. Was it just one thing like, oh, they canceled spring, spring bear season, so hell with this, I'm going to Texas? Or <laughs> was well, it like a I lot mean, of you know that there's a famous line from Davy Crockett, you know, y'all can go to hell, I'm going to Texas. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so and, and teaching was awesome. It was a lot of fun, um, and yet it wasn't something. It goes along with that whole choosing a life for myself. It wasn't something that I really wanted to do when I was in the middle or in high school. Black Hawk Down came out, mm-hmm. and my senior year of high school was 9-11. And I was like, dude, all I wanted to do is jump out of helicopters, be surrounded, be an Army Ranger. Um, but I played uh, high school sports, and I was a pretty good athlete, and so I ended up going to college and playing college football and college lacrosse. Mm-hmm. And when you're there, you got to get a degree. And I was like, well, I'm going to get a degree in PE because I like sports. And so then I... You know, at that time, was coaching high school football in, in between going to classes and, and doing that. And so I was like, well, let's give teaching a shot just because, you know, I like sports. And then all of a sudden, 16 years later, I'm in a career when I'm like, holy smokes, this is cool. And yet it's not necessarily what I want to choose. So we're in a transition period right now. I started, up, started a new career as a mortgage loan officer, uh, helping people you know, fulfill their dreams and get their homes and, and, you know, impact their lives that way. But, but the teaching never leaves, right? Like it is ingrained in me and who I am. And that's why I love to share this idea of hunting and, and this, this thing that has impacted my life so much with everyone else. Okay. Hold on. Do you do construction loans for it in Idaho? I am not licensed for the state of Idaho. I'm licensed in, in Washington, Texas, and Florida. All right, all you listeners out there, if there's somebody that does construction loans in the state of Idaho, hit me up, Jim at the Western Huntsman dot com. Carry on. <laughs> I love it. I, I love it. We're um, at that point. So, yeah, it's, so it's time. What's been? Uh, so you you go to Texas. Why'd you choose Texas? You know, I, it's one of those things where 
I didn't necessarily choose Texas. Texas chose me. My wife and I actually had a house in under contract in the state of Montana. Oh man. Oh really? Um, yeah. Well, I was going to be Ryan Lamper's neighbor. We were about to live uh, 10 minutes apart um, out in three forks, Montana. Oh yeah. Had a house under contract. Man, there's some so sweet we, fishing out at a three forks. Oh, not a terrible place right? to be. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, not at all. And we, uh, we were able to purchase 10 acres that is just, you know, remote land out in three forks as well. And so it was like, Oh, we're going to be by some land to recreate on Montana, all this stuff. Um, but then Montana is very expensive to live in and it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't offer as much uh, job opportunities for, for people. And so we were looking at Montana, we we're under contract and then my wife and, ended up going to Texas to visit my brother who just recently moved down here and they were having their fourth kid. And, and I was like, well, take a look at homes while you're down there and see if you see anything you like. And all of a sudden we're like, wow, the home prices down here are so much cheaper and there's a lot more job availability. I was like, well, I guess we're looking a hard right. And we're going to Texas. So uh, don't necessarily consider the forever home or, that'll be here my entire life, but it is a time of season. And right now it's pretty awesome. So you kind of pulled, pulled the strings on the, um, or, uh, you know, pulled the deal on the, on the Montana property and, and headed down there, huh? Oh yeah. What, uh, yeah. what was your initial reaction getting to Texas when uh, you like got there and realized the, the humidity and all that kind of stuff in the summer? <laughs> <laughs> so this summer, ironically, um, you know, every summer's hot, right? But oh, yeah. when when you get here and the locals are like, yeah, this is the hottest summer we've had on record for like the last 15 years. You're like, oh, great. Um, so we went over 30 days or 35 days of over 100 degree temperatures the entire time. Mm-hmm. And it was like, dude, no reprieve, just getting beat down. It was awesome. I loved it. Uh, really? Yes. Because that's because well, you were Western Washington, stuff. right? Right. Yeah, Western Washington, mild, yep. calm. Um, you know, it's, it it challenges you in a different way. I'll tell you this: that humidity and that heat, that combination. No wonder so many gritty people come out of the state of Texas. There is a reason uh, yeah. why so many Navy SEALs or very uh, very tough individuals hail from Texas and. You know, the, that weather and everything down here wants to kill you, it seems like. I've already caught the scorpions in my house and um, there's, you know, rattlesnakes and all sorts of stuff. The, I was walking on the grass and all these stickers were in my feet. I was like, dang, man. Yeah. Just trying to, oh, yeah, man. Just trying to live. The snakes, the bugs. I mean, I love Texas, man. I've, I've spent a lot of time in Texas. It's a, the people are fantastic. It's like Texas has its own, you know, every state has its own like unique culture in a way, right? But it's mm-hmm. really defined in Texas. And people that are from Texas are very proud of being from Texas, you know, and it's, it's, it's got their, this, this very unique cultural thing. Uh, they've got a very unique history as to how the state of Texas came about. Um, I, I, for like, for me, I, you couldn't pry me out of Idaho, uh, for, for anything. But, um, it, if, if I were to like, sometimes when it's snowing really bad here, like it has been this last week, you know, my wife and I look at each other and we're like, you know, what about New Mexico or maybe Texas, <laughs> you know, where, where the winters are a little bit more mild. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, there's like no, I don't think Texas even has winners compared to, they had that thing a couple of years ago, or was that last winter when they had a major power outage and, and um, that storm? Yeah, I think that, I think that was during 2020, two years ago. Yeah, the ice storm. And it was it two years ago? Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and just kind of left them, you know, people without power for a long time. The supply chain was in trouble and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean... Anyway, the point being, uh, Texas would be a great place. I, I have my reservations about uh, Texas in a, in a sense that, you know, the, the, the availability of public land uh, and and that kind of stuff would be problematic for me because I, I read a statistic somewhere that's like less than 5% of the state of Texas is publicly accessible. There is only one call company here at the Western Huntsman, and that is Phelps Game Calls, born out of hunting. 
and the necessity to make the best calls on the market. Jason Phelps started this company in his garage back in 2009, and now he's got some of the finest lineup of elk calls, turkey calls, predator calls, waterfowl calls available on the market. If you guys go to the website, check it out and get what you need. And if you're in the market, when you go to checkout, use promo code HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off. Whether you're just getting started or have expert-level calling skills, check it out at Phelps Game Calls. Get them close. Hoffman Boots is a fourth-generation owned boot company, a family of shoemakers based in North Idaho. I've been sporting a pair of Hoffmans for close to a decade, and I really like the Hoffman Explorer in the 8-inch. It's the best boot out there, so check it out at hoffmanboots.com, and you'll see the whole lineup of hunting boots and lineman boots and pack boots and everything else right there on the website. And if you choose to purchase a pair of boots, make sure you use the promo code all caps lock HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off. Scree Gear, extreme high-performance hunting attire and gear that is scientifically tested, complete layering systems, and some of the finest merino wool products to keep you warm and comfortable. And it's all backed by a great company. What I really like about Scree is if you go to the website, they have these bundle options like the elk bundle or the whitetail bundle or the turkey bundle, all that stuff that'll get you completely outfitted for your favorite hunt. The starter bundle is a really good deal. Make sure you check that out. They've got the VIP sizing guarantee. And so you can exchange something if it doesn't fit right at absolutely no charge to you. Guys, it's a great warranty, great company. And at checkout, as always, use promo code the Western Huntsman for 15% off and free shipping. The Elk Collective. Folks, the best investment you can make when it comes to hunting is what's between your ears. Having elk knowledge is what separates those who succeed every once in a while versus those who notch a tag every single year. So go to the Elk Collective and sign up. There's over 150 videos in this online course to teach you everything you need to know by some of the best experts to ever enter the elk woods. It's a great program at a great price, guys. And if you use the promo code, the Western Huntsman, you're going to get 20 bucks off of your entire course. So instead of 89 bucks, you'll get it for $69. And now that September is over and we're into October and November and all these fall hunts, if you get it now, you're going to have an entire year to go through all this course. And believe me, you're going to need it. There's so much content in there. So check it out and use the promo code, the Western Huntsman, all one word. Last but not least is Tacticam. Guys, you know I've been using Tacticam for a very long time. I really like my Tacticam 5.0s. I like my Tacticam in the wide lens, so you can get that kind of wider angle and shot. Uh, the, they've upgraded now. They've got the Tacticam 6.0, which is super cool. I can't wait to get mine. And also the cell cams. Don't forget about the Tacticam Reveal cell cams. They've got a bunch of different series of these things, and I've got them all over my property, so I know what's going on at all times. Whether I got a bear that's coming after my chickens, or if I have an intruder down at the driveway, or if I have a giant monster whitetail buck over in my hunting spot i know what is going on at all times i love my tacticam reveals guys check it out at tacticam.com let's get back to the show here we go i i don't know that would how does that affect you do you, do you did you look at that before you moved to texas and were like man i don't know about you know in washington you've got all this access this public land and all these different species you can hunt which obviously texas has a lot of different species uh, yeah. but how did, how did that work out for you? What, like, was that a consideration? It's a great question. And you asked me earlier, what took me to Texas? Well, I, I didn't really answer that, but I'll say freedom and politics took me to Texas. Um, mm-hmm. and so when it came to, uh, this idea of public land, dude, I am, I'm pro public land all the way until it crosses the line with pro second amendment. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. pro second amendment before anything else. And cause this idea of public lands is more of a liberal concept, right? Is that it, it, it's something that we commune and share I think with it's, everyone. I think, I think that the, the liberal concept of it is something that has developed over the, over the years. It, it shouldn't be because it's, it's a, it's a freedom thing. Like this is, this is your land. This is my land. We have the freedom to go utilize this land. And I think that 
there has been this shift in in a sense where liberals have kind of stolen the concept of public lands and then you have some of these politicians uh like Ted Cruz is not super um hip on on public land and 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 that is my big gripe with anything on the right politically is their lack of support for public lands um yep. a- anyways i kind of cut you off there man i get no, fired i appreciate up. it I appreciate it. Well, the, so the concept is, is um, you know, the public lands is huge. How, and with that being said, um, there's not a whole lot of it down here. There is public land that's very uh, res- restrained and restricted as far as like, if you have this parcel of public land, it's only open for certain types of animals to hunt with and certain types of weapons. And you can only access it at certain times of the year is what I've gathered so far. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, it's not just like, you know, if I just want to take a hike or go up to the mountains, I can't just do that down here. Um, and that is, is challenging to my soul. I miss looking on the horizon and seeing mountains. And at the same time, like you said earlier, there's always something to kill down here in Texas. Oh man. And there's yeah. always something always, to hunt. Dude. And it's I want to come down there and hunt hogs, man. Yes. I had my first opportunity um, back in September, I shot my very first hog. Did you really? Uh, yep. I, I, I got to. <laughs> well, but here, here's Texas. This goes back to the whole people are friendly down here. Go down the street um, to what is called what the family dollar or dollar general or something like that. Little little mini mart to pick up some milk and bread for the kids. And my wife goes in and I'm in the car with the three amigos with the air conditioning on. And my, my wife's in line, and there's this guy uh, behind her, and, and somehow they started talking. Turns out he likes bear hunting. My wife's like, oh, you like bear hunting? you got to meet my husband. She brings him out to the parking lot. I end up meeting him. Uh, we start chatting, and he took me on my very first hunt in, here in Texas, and I got, I got uh, my first hog. And I was like, dude, all because of just a random conversation at a, at a grocery store. And that's the type of people that are down here. You know, just, God, just cool, salt man. of the earth people. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's way cool, actually. <laughs> um, so did you, I guess, did you have a hunting season this year? Or did you, were you there kind of too late to be considered a resident? Or how does that work in Texas? Yeah, so um, you, have to, you have to live in Texas for six months before you can claim residency and get a resident license. And so with me purchasing all of my hunting tags before I moved, because I didn't get down here until June, uh, in late late June, uh, I actually already have my state of Washington licenses purchased and my special permits put in. And it turns out that I drew a quality bull tag, a quality bull elk tag in the state of Washington. And I was like, so sweet. Um, so yeah, my seasons, as far as hunting was a little cut short. I went to Idaho for spring bear with initial scent backpacks with Dennis Stokes and Joe Ellison had an amazing time. We had our opportunities. Um, it just didn't work out one time, uh, coming around the corner, we jumped a bear and no one was ready to shoot. The other time we got set up and one of our mentees, Will Weber, who is now a member of soul seekers. Uh, got him on I his had, very first Yeah, I bear. had Will on the show one t- uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, just a phenomenal human being. Yeah. Well, Will Will uh, was able to take two shots on a black bear at a pretty tough angle, tough distance. First one missed. The second one, he would have absolutely drilled this bear, except there was one random branch in the way. And we got it all on film, so you're going to get to see that in season three of Soul Seekers on Carbon TV. But uh he he killed the branch and not the bear, and that bear got away. <laughs> Did you bummer. tell him that, that the bear would taste a lot better than the branch? I did, but, Did. you know, something, something about he just really felt like she would. <laughs> well... <laughs> It's, uh, it's fun. Tell him not to be too hard on himself because, um, uh, <laughs> that, that happened to me a couple of times during elk season where the, the, the branch ate my arrow instead of the elk, uh, kind of thing. So the, uh, with, with him, I want to, I want to talk, talk about with Will Weber and, and what we talked about on my show when I had him on and this, this concept of, of soul seekers and, and your mentorship philosophy, um, you were kind of somebody that took him under his wing and introduced him to hunting. And yeah. uh, what 
what's the motivation behind that? I mean, I know what it is, but share with the audience like what the motivation is with the concept of of uh, mentorship in hunting and getting people out there and and being you know like you said a steward. Uh, well, actually, no, what did you call it? An ambassador to hunting. Yeah, uh, for for the yeah. non hunter. Um, give us give us a little bit of philosophical uh, drop ins as to why you do that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, before I do, I want to ask you a question, Jim. You ever? What's your favorite restaurant? You ever eaten that? My favorite restaurant. Yeah, what's your favorite restaurant? Oh man, I don't know. There's a really good steakhouse in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, called uh, the the Wolf Lodge. It used to okay. be it used to be awesome. I don't know if it's any good anymore. Okay, and so once you ate at that restaurant, did you tell everybody about it? Like, oh man, you got to go eat at that restaurant. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, why? Because it was that good, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's hunting. Hunting is that good that if it's so good, you want to naturally tell everybody about it. Mm -hmm. Guys, come check this out. Look how awesome this is. My life was transformed. Everything is better now. I'm better husband, better father, better employee, better yada, yada, yada. Got to experience this. If you don't hunt, got to check it out. Come on. That's why. That is the whole purpose is like, if you love something so much, I was always told, you know, uh, like back when I used to date girls and they'd break up with me or, you know, if it wouldn't work out, it's like, you know, if you love it so much, you need to set it free. And if it's meant to be, it'll come back to you. Right. <laughs> yep. Well, I apply that to hunting. I love hunting so much that I want to give it away to every single person I encounter. What I you- want at every person to experience that joy, that satisfaction, that, um, that camaraderie, the, the challenging of your character and personality and, and soul through hunting. And, and that's just, that's why I believe mentorship is conservation. What do you say to those out there? Because I, I, I agree with, with what you're talking about. And I am one of the hunters out there and there's people that will argue with me uh, that believes that it is, it is critical for us for the future of hunting to grow the ranks of hunters And, but we've always got the hunters out there, um, and you know, um, I don't know, oxymoron, whatever you want to call it. I'm one of those two that can sometimes get upset and bitch about the fact that the woods are a little crowded, right? So what do you say to those that kind of push back on that and say, we have enough hunters and we need to quit bringing new hunters on because, you know, it's already hard enough to get a tag and, and it's already, you know, a a shit show out in a public land name you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and they, they kind of fight you for that because I, I, that creates a lot of tension sometimes, especially on social media. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, first thing I would address is this competition breeds success. The cream naturally rises to the top and you're always going to get out of hunting what you put into it. So if you want to be lazy in your hunting experiences, and just kind of go out for the fun of it and you know like this is deer camp and we just kind of experience it in this way awesome it's all about what you want we always we always get what we want in the end right Mm -hmm. so it's a matter of how bad you want it what are you willing to sacrifice in order to get what you want in life and so for the hunters that complain and push back about mentorship or this concept like it's too crowded it's like well, what do you really want if you want an easy hunt then you're going to be surrounded with people that are able to access it more if you want to get away from the crowds you got to go to places where you are getting away from crowds you know maybe maybe nine miles wasn't enough and maybe you'll run into a yoga instructor but that might be an opportunity for you to, to advocate for hunting in a way that has never been done to people before The other aspect of it is, is, you know, people want hunting to last, but they want hunting to last from a selfish perspective, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, I don't want what I love to get taken away from me. You know, I don't want spring bear in the state of Washington to get taken away from me. So I'm going to advocate for that rather than like the lineage of it, right? And I think a lot of it comes down to how impactful hunting has been. If it's been something that 
this is just what you do. And this is, I go to this stump and I sit on this knob and I watch this draw year after year after year, you know, hunting might not have that same impact on your soul the way it was for me, who it was a choice that I made for myself and it challenged my courage and my determination. And, you know, you re- I really had to learn how to hunt rather than just kind of being in the hunting. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it addresses the topic of like, what do you want? And so for people that complain about, well, you know, hunting's too crowded as is. And like, you know what? Competition breeds success. Ultimately, if you're going to get out of it, what you put into it. And if it's harder to draw tags, then that's not necessarily a hunter's number problem. Maybe it's the way that the state is doing their draws or, or whatever. And, you know, I can't speak too much towards that since I've only been putting in for points for like six years <laughs> or in any given state. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What, what's your take on, on what I just shared? How did that, how that hit you? No, I, I, I would, I would agree for the most part. I think, I think that, um, you know, it, it, it does get, there's two sides of it, right? There, that you do get, there is a lot of frustration that comes out of wanting to get the right tag and the right state. Um, you know, and, and I, 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 there's, there's tools to help us with that, like Eastman's tag hub. And I talk about it in some of the ads that I do all the time. Uh, Eastman's has a tag hub that the, the service that helps you find these tags, but it's still frustrating because, there is a tag for Idaho that I want, uh, that I've been putting in for every year that, that would be an elk hunt. And I never get drawn for it because there's a bunch of other people that know about it and they want it too. Right. And so does that get frustrating? Yes. Does that mean I want to not allow new hunters and new blood to come into the, uh, I always hate calling it a sport, but for the sake of ease, I'll call it a sport. Uh, do we want a bunch of new hunters coming into the sport? We do. And unquestionably. Um, and, and, and in terms of the tag, the, the, you know, difficulties getting a tag in certain units in certain states, that's very much situational dependent because there are some states that, uh, they're just messed up in how they did it. They, they do it. Like you said, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to get a tag. You got to wait, you get the, you know, uh, point creep and all the other things that come into the whole draw systems. Uh, we can argue that until we're blue in the t- uh, face regarding what states do it well, what states don't do it well, because there's two sides of that spectrum. You got, you know, the, the, the point systems in some states, and then you have states that are like the Wild West, like here in Idaho, where it's over the counter. And uh, I hate the way they do that for non... I feel bad for non-residents that uh, have to deal with the online purchasing of, of tags on December 1st or December 2nd. I can't remember what day that falls on, uh, but that's always a shit show. Um so there's that aspect of it, right? And there's ways yeah. around it. There are ways around it. If you're that frustrated, there are ways around it. Like like I said, you jump on Eastman's Tag Hub and it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, right. But the concept of trying to keep new hunters out of hunting is is very problematic. And and I think I just had this uh, a similar discussion last week. Uh, but it's it's important, and I don't think it could be said enough, but the statistical data out there that is available for the number of hunters that are active tag holders every single year in America is way down compared to what it used to be. And that is what, um, if you're as crazy as I am and, and get on like Instagram and follow these anti-hunting groups, that is the common theme that they always talk about. Well, hunting's dying. The hunting is, is on its way out. The numbers are way down. And, and, and they, they use this as a way to comfort themselves as like when they have some kind of legislative loss, like Montana, just, um, the the judge over there just basically put the kibosh to some lawsuit that was going to end wolf hunting and trapping in the state of Montana. Um, the judge basically said, well, look, there's no evidence to to support this anti-hunting, anti-wolf hunting, trapping legislation or, or, uh, this uh, to, to do like an emergency stop of hunting and, and, uh, trapping in the state of Montana for 2022. So no, it, it, it continues on. So they were just up in arms, right? And they're, they're going on and on and on about how, um, you know, that, that it was a wrong decision. They need to save the wolves right now because according to them, the wolves are in dire straits and they're about to be extinct. And it's just BS. They, they, I don't know if they, they really truly believe that or if they're just trying to propagate other people. But the point is that's always their go-to argument. The, the thing with that, Johnny, is they're a, they're, they're 
they're not exactly accurate by saying that hunting is on its way out nor and it's dying because actually hunting there are uh, certain demographics of hunting that are uh, that are on the rise and we know that um but i i am troubled by the future of hunting in a sense of the rate that hunting is either growing or or dying based on what demographic it is when i say demographic i mean you know the the tennessee private land whitetail hunter versus the backcountry you know colorado mule deer hunter kind of thing um mm-hmm. we have to really be cognizant of, of of what it looks like in the future because those rates are much slower than the rate of growth in the anti-hunting movement. And we see that in Washington with the loss of the spring bear in California uh, and, and these other states. You know, New Mexico recently lost its trapping abilities. Those things, we cannot allow ourselves to become outnumbered by the anti-hunting movement because they are very well-funded and they are very loud. And so yeah. that, I guess, was a very long way of explaining <laughs> that I, I agree with the concept and, and I love the added... Um, part of of what your message is of hunting is is mentorship and it's a great way to bring new people in and mentor them and teach them the right way uh to advocate and hunt um that's i i guess in a nutshell what what i would respond with that yeah yeah no you're you're right on, on so many regards i want to tie a whole lot of different things in throughout this episode already that we've talked about into into what we're talking about here is um, and first off, I want to say a lot of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to mentoring hunters is that it is giving away a location. I joke at times that that coordinates is con- uh, <laughs> coordinates is uh, conservation. That is not coordinates <laughs> is not <laughs> conservation. Uh, mentorship is not coordinates. Mentorship is conservation. It's investing in the lives of others. It doesn't have to be. Uh, taking somebody to your spot and saying, this is how I do it right here, right there. You know, teach a man or give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You're giving somebody the skill set to be able to do it on their own. A lot of the times when I take out mentees hunting, they do not even hold a tag for the animals that we are pursuing. A lot of the times when I mentor hunters, they are just coming along to experience the hunt. And as we're hunting, we're talking to them about the whys. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And then hopefully there's an animal down and they get to get hands on with that animal. And then the process, the idea of processing and still dressing the animal doesn't become so intimidating. And then like, well, how do we take care of me? How long can it hang in a bag in a tree or, you know, like, all these questions that new hunters have. The barrier to entry is not just not just take me to your location. It is everything that that hunting uh, revolves around. And so often than not, when we are have been doing it for a long time, we kind of just say, "Oh, I don't know. It's just the way I do it," rather than actually being able to explain the details. Mm-hmm. And earlier, earlier we talked about like state of Washington, the neighborhoods, and kids playing indoors more often than not. You know, the statistics, I, I believe, say that if you don't get a child hooked into the outdoors by the age of 10 or 12, that they are going to be lost to not wanting to pursue it. Yeah. I also know that as a former educator, that if you do not have uh, a child or a student, and I'm not just going to say a, a, a child because this goes for adults as well, if somebody does not have success within their first couple tries of something, then they're more often than not going to give up and then not return back to it. And so the experience of success doesn't just mean killing an animal. As long as somebody can take tangible things and be like, oh, I learned this and I can apply it to my tool belt, that is success. And now you're giving them the the uh, little pieces of tidbits that's going to keep them hooked, keep them engaged. Like, oh, okay, I can do this now. Okay, I can do this now. And so when it comes to this idea of mentorship, yeah, most people live an indoor life. We Mm -hmm. know as society that nature's healing, nature's renewing, hunting is good for our souls. The meat is good for our bodies. You know, I was watching just Yellowstone last night and I think Beth Dutton was explaining to this vegan about how anything that eats grass 
uh, humans can't eat grass. You have to grind it down in order to then even consume it. And, and so anything that eats grass is what we end up eating to end up getting those nutrients. So it's, I was like, man, it's really interesting. That show, that show has a man. That show has a way of like simplifying some complicated uh, concepts when it comes to meat eating versus veganism. <laughs> oh, dude, it's fascinating. Truly yeah. fascinating. It really Truly is. Truly fascinating. Uh, and so this idea of like, you know, people are so hung up on one bad apple. Like, oh, I want. I mentored a hunter one time and. He ended up burning me and returning back to my location or hunting a spot that I showed him. It's like, okay, well, guys, everybody, pause for a second. There needs to be rules of engagement. There -hmm. needs to be protocol, right? So if you're going to mentor somebody, you need to, number one, have trust. Trust is the foundation of every successful relationship, that communication, right? And so if you don't enjoy being around that person enough to hang out with them on a weekend, then taking them hunting is probably not going to be the best idea because if you don't have that much time and you're using your time to mentor and give, that's awesome. However, we need to, we need to still enjoy our time. We don't want to ruin what we love for us for the sake of others at the same time. Like there is a balance. And so this protocol of like rules of engagement. All right. If I take you a fill, I want you to understand this, that this is a place that I ended up finding on my own, or I've been doing this. And what you are going to do is you are going to use this as a template for you to find your own locations, you know, and that, or don't, or, or, or yeah, go ahead, Jim. No, that you're right on track, man, with uh, kind of what I've, I've talked about this before, where it's, there's a big difference between taking a new hunter out to, for the sake of taking a new hunter out and being a mentor that the the mentee needs to understand why you're going to that particular spot why did we pick this mountain why did we pick this draw what what is a what are the habitat conditions that make this conducive to find wild game here and that's that's mentoring versus hey yeah you can tag along with me and we're gonna go to this mountain and we're gonna sit over this draw and I don't ever want you to come here without me Right. There, there's there's right. a reason. There's a reason we're hunting these areas. And sometimes that's really hard to articulate. But uh, what I like about you, Johnny, is you, you you put your money where your mouth is. Um, can we <laughs> can we talk about this event you've got coming up in uh, Western Washington this weekend? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate it. And first off, I just want to say thank you, Jim, for having me on, man. It's it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to come on the Western Huntsman podcast. And, oh, shoot, man. And to, and to be able no, to share, share everything. Um, I, I don't know. So, I, 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 I think we talked about this last time we spoke because uh, I was on your show last week. Um, I don't know how we haven't connected. And I, I don't know why I haven't had you on my show yet. I thought I had it in my mind that you have been on the show. And uh, apparently th- this is the first time, and it, it, like honestly, that came as a surprise for me. I, I just, for some reason, had it in my mind that we we we'd already connected and and done all this. So, my apologies for that. Oh no worries, brother. No worries. Time of the season. Time of the season. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, so the community events. Okay, so uh, for all the listeners who do not understand or know much about me and my mission and the whole idea of mentorship as conservation is. When I got into hunting and not having anybody who taught me or any community of support, I was like, okay, well, how do I build community within the hunting world? How do I make friends? How do I make connections? And at the same time, here I am with this mission of mentorship as conservation. How do I share it with the world? And so before I had a podcast and before I had a TV show and before I had a website, it was, well, I guess we're going to follow the field of dreams mentality. And if you build it, they will come. Mm-hmm. And so I created an Instagram account and started naturally getting followers just through the certain content that I was posting. And at that point I only ever killed one animal and, you know, it was just kind of sharing information. Well, that first event back in 2018, I had 13 people show up from all over the state of Washington, just because they followed the Instagram account and ended up showing up mm-hmm. from there. I realized the power in which social media holds and how there are people who are thirsting for connection and thirsting for community. 
People want to be connected. We, we rely on technology to connect us in the digital world, but we need that face-to-face -face connection. We, it, it, you know, community, sitting around a campfire and sharing stories is like, it's so primal to who we are as human beings that for us to be able to gather in numbers, there's also power in numbers. Mm -hmm. And so when we can commune together all for the same purpose and the same mission, things really start happening. So started the first community event and held it at uh, Tony's, Two Shot Tony's Brewery and had some people show up and it was a good time, got connected. And I was like, you know what? I can do this. And I just started hosting a bunch of different community events. And every December we would do a fundraiser. Started off with a toy drive for Seattle Children's Hospital. We started doing fundraisers for first responders and all sorts of stuff. Well, this year we are doing a fundraiser for Blood Origins nonprofit. So if you ever heard of Blood Love Origins, it. yes, founded by Robbie Kroger. Um, he is a powerhouse of a, of a human being and somebody who loves hunting and understands the transformative power that it holds. And that is why his mission under Blood Origins is to convey the truth about hunting. So the idea is that we're going to take our mission of mentorship is conservation and build a community, allow, create a platform for people to come and get plugged in. I don't have the ability to mentor everybody. That's not what I, you know, always want to be doing. I also have a little bit of a selfish nature at times where it's like, I also want to be able to hunt for myself. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I'm not, sure. I'm not always mentoring people. However, I am always having conversations with people. And if people want to ask questions, I'm willing to engage with them. So we create this environment for people to come get connected, have fun. And at the same time, it's a captivated audience to share a mission and share a purpose. Well, I will always share my story and, and how uh, Soul Seekers got started. But this year we're bringing in Robbie Kroger from he's flying in from the state of Tennessee uh, to, to Muckleteal, Washington. And he's going to be conveying the truth about hunting, which is a very important aspect because nowadays, a lot of hunters love hunting. They want to advocate for hunting. However, and I'm going to use, speak specifically to me, is I didn't feel like I had any knowledge or talking points about how to defend hunting. Yeah. And so the, uh, the ability to articulate how to defend the thing you love is extremely powerful just in itself. Whether you mentor another hunter, the ability for you to be able to talk for hunting is huge. And so we're bringing Robbie Kroger into the house. Um, he His nonprofit just started a little over a year ago, and our goal is to raise over $10,000. We got a whole bunch of different donations from wonderful companies all throughout the hunting industry, um, from firearms to triggers to gun stocks to uh, predator calls to um, food and supplements, knives, African hunt, a fishing trip, all sorts of stuff. Uh, we're going to have some vendors there as well. And the whole idea is to build community, use it as a networking event, get plugged in with other people, have your cell phones there. I always put name tags on every single person. So I expect people to shake hands and not be wallflowers. Like you get out of it what you put into it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this Saturday, December 10th at 4 p.m. and Muckleteal, Washington at Straight Sheet Fabrications, which is, by the way, the business of Will Weber. He opened up his doors. It's his way of giving back uh, to something that is given to him so much. All ages are welcome. Food and beverages are available for purchase, and we're going to be having a uh, silent auction or raffles, and it's free to attend. So show up, everybody. Hey, Come can, be can a part of it. Give us the location again, Johnny. I, I can't tell if that muffled out just in, in my mic, or I mean my headphones, or, or if that was on your end. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So it's at Straight Sheet Fabrication. So 4493 Russell Road, Unit D, as in dog, Muckleteal, Washington, 98275, Straight Sheet Fabrications. Sweet. And that's the location of our event. Starts at 4 p.m. and I want to pack the house. There is um, every single person that shows up is going to get a free membership to SeasonReport.com, which is a living almanac for hunters and foragers and uh, gardeners, ironically. Have you ever checked out Season Report? Uh-uh, no. 
Well, I know you're into that homestead lifestyle. You might want to check it out. Yeah. Every person that, that attends is going to get a free membership to that. And then there's all so many different things that you're going to be able to walk away from uh, as long as you engage in the raffles and, and the silent auctions. It's presented by Onyx Hunt. They've donated so many different memberships and swag. And guys, it's going to be an amazing thing. The whole point is you can never outgive good. When you put good out into the world, it's naturally going to boomerang back to you. And the idea is that we want to leave this world a better place than how we found it. And Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And so, you know, the definition of insanity, Jim, is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've been doing the same thing over and over and you're tired of it and you're ready for a change, then take some action in your life and be a part of it and come, come get connected and get plugged in with us. Man, I love it, man. I I wish I can attend that event. Uh, I can't leave the homestead right now. Uh, with with this weather, we can't we can't leave. Um, <laughs> when you live on a fifth in a fifth wheel, uh, with water and and everything else, you're trying to make sure it doesn't freeze up. I just I simply can't leave and until this this weather gets better. But I'd love to uh, attend an, an event like that, and especially because you got Robbie coming from Blood Origins. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Blood Origins. I, I do their little monthly donate thing, and and um, I, I think it's a it's a great cause. It's worthwhile. Um, and if you guys if you guys listening as a side note don't know anything about Blood Origins, uh, we did an episode with Robbie uh, not not this last summer, the summer before, uh, where he explains the mission, and uh, you can jump on there and become like a recurring monthly donor for like two bucks or three bucks or whatever. Um, a yeah. month. It's and it's worth it because Robbie does a great job at articulating where we are at as hunters when, and what we're up against, and and combating these anti-hunting um, organizations that you know are just flooding the the interwaves, <laughs> if you will, mm -hmm. with uh, with misinformation and, and like real misinformation, not yeah. not uh, not a liberal. Def defining misinformation <laughs> right, right. Uh, it, he, he's challenging and changing and recorrecting the narrative of hunting yeah so yeah. blood, blood is, a, is a global nonprofit whose mission is to convey the truth about hunting and to promote conservation efforts they do this by creating content and sharing stories that convey the impact that hunting has on people wildlife and communities and one of the special things about blood origins is Robbie was born South African. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't born in America. So he understands the whole idea of like the African side of hunting. He takes this global perspective towards hunting. It's not just, Oh, here in America or Western hunting or whitetail hunting. It is hunting and we are hunters mm -hmm. and it's time for us to get a united voice and to really speak the truth about hunting. Well, brother man, I I'd love to get you back on in the future. Yep. For it. Oh, absolutely. I know you got to you got to run yeah. and pick up some kids, right? Yeah, that's right. I got to go get the three amigos from school and uh and get rocking and rolling on this beautiful Monday. By the way, it's 77 degrees down here and the blue sky is shining. I mean, why it's, why? Uh, why do I didn't even request a, a Texas weather report <laughs> and like I'm sitting here in my coveralls, man, because it's so damn cold. <laughs> yeah, when you messaged me before, you're like, I got to heat up the studio. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, <did. laughs> I do, man. I, it takes it, it, it. I have to crank the furnace on high, and it takes a good ten minutes for this sucker to even get tolerable uh, to to be in. So uh, I appreciate the seventy seven degree weather update from your end, you <laughs> jerk. <laughs> Jim, I gotta just tell you, man, you're, you're an awesome oh. human being. You, uh, what you stand for, and 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 how you stand is inspiring and it doesn't go unnoticed i just want to share if you if you wouldn't mind real quick guys if you cannot make it to the event but you still want to donate to blood origins you can go to bloodorigins.org and uh, donate there um our we're going to have some social media like instagram lives going at our event however it's not going to be able to go the entire time as there's going to be a lot of other media happening um but if you are interested i wish we had the ability to do live auction um for people who don't attend um but unfortunately we won't but you can still donate to blood origins and even if you're not going to be at the event if you are come and get ready to have a blast 
And Jim, thank you so yeah. much for having me on, brother. I really no, appreciate thank it. Thank you, man. Thanks. Thanks for doing this event. We need, we need more of this uh, throughout the country. We need more of this kind of collaboration of hunters and getting together and raising money and, and uh, actually, you know, getting our elbows uh, into this because this fight is is ours. It's what we have. We don't want it, but it's here, and it's it's something that we've we've always got to be aware of uh, if we want a future in hunting. And so this this kind of stuff is super important. I appreciate you getting involved. I really like uh, wh- what you do with Soul Seekers and the podcast and uh, the, the the message that you have. I I think that that is the right direction. I, I think we're moving the needle by by doing this kind of stuff and collaborating with each other and and uh, instead of you know every man for himself out there hoping that there's going to always be a future in hunting, uh, it's actions that that you're taking um, and 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 partnering up with Blood Origins. It's those kind of actions that uh, is going to make a huge impact on on uh, you know future for for generations to come, man. So I, I just appreciate it. I appreciate you joining me on the show. Uh, it was last minute, so thanks for that too. <laughs> oh, absolutely, my um, pleasure. And let's do I it again. Want, dude, I really appreciate it. If I can just leave your listeners with one thing, real quick. Yeah, you bet, man. Inspired people, people who live an inspired life, inspire others. I was always taught that inspired people inspire people, and so if you're if you are looking for some inspiration it's time to get out of what you do each and every day, get out of your mundane routines and and change it up because the minute that that spark touches your soul, the minute that that spark hits other people, it's only a slight breeze to turn it into a forest fire and to set this world ablaze. And so when you live an inspired life, it's contagious just like if you smile at somebody, it's natural for somebody to smile back at you. That is how we need to look at hunting, and that is how we need to treat hunting, whether it's how we speak for it, whether it's how we show it off with who we are and how we are and our lifestyle. Inspired people inspire others, and it's time to, uh, to transform this world. Fantastic, man. Well, Johnny, thanks again for coming on the show, man. Oh, Jim, my pleasure, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, you guys, uh, I, I can't wait to see how this event unfolds for you this weekend. And uh, guys, if you're in Western Washington, check it out. Hit up the event, and uh, hopefully it's the biggest one yet. Uh, thanks again, Johnny. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank you very much. You made it. That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure you're following us on Instagram at the Western Huntsman and write us a good review at Apple Podcasts. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.